Good evening. I work at the World Economic Forum, and what we try to do there is put together analysis and hopefully action for some of the greatest challenges in the world. One of those challenges is the challenge of the gender gap. What is that? And I'm going to try to give you a personal example to explain that. I grew up in Pakistan. I was one of two sisters, the older one. My greatest fear was that one day I would have a brother. And it was a justified fear, because all around me, I saw my friends, female friends, their parents, having more and more and more children so that they could have more sons. And once they had those sons, they invested lavishly on them, often at the cost of their daughters. This is one manifestation of the gender gap. Multiply that with millions of families doing the same thing. And you get the situation that you have in Pakistan today. So let's take an example. A Pakistani boy is 30% more likely to have gone to secondary school than a girl, 10% more likely to have made it to university, about three times more likely to have made it into the workforce. And even if women have made it into the workforce, they're paid about a fifth of what men are paid. And men are 30 times more likely to have made it to a position of leadership. But it's not just a problem in a country like Pakistan. This is a global problem. Let's take Swiss children. So the good news is they're equally likely to be educated all the way through from primary, secondary, through to university education. But it doesn't look the same when you get to the workplace. Men still make it to the workplace more often. They get paid about 30% more than women do. And they're twice as likely to make it into leadership positions. So this happens the world over. And it's a problem. Being an economist, the first thing I wanted to do was try to measure this problem. Because what we can measure, we can try to address. And so at the World Economic Forum, for the last 10 years, we have been trying to understand the size of gender gaps. How do we define this? So we try to look at things like health. Are women and men equally healthy? We look at education, so are women and men making it into primary, secondary, and university education at the same rates? We look at things like the workforce, but we try look to look at not just whether they're making it into the workforce, but also what's happening once they're there. Are they making it into leadership positions? Are they getting paid the same? Are they making it into skilled positions? And then what's happening in parliaments? What's happening in ministerial level positions? And we try to do this for 142 countries. Now, there's 10,000 data points in this report, and I won't try to summarize them for you. But I will give you just a, a few of the takeaways. Here's what the world looks like. The Nordic countries occupy the top five positions on our rankings. And Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Yemen, countries like that are towards the bottom. But there are huge differences between these countries, huge differences that transform to very different lives for the people behind these statistics. Now, we're trying to look at gender gaps regardless of whether a country is rich or poor. We're saying if it's a rich country or a poor country, how equally you are dividing your resources and opportunities between women and men. And that's roughly what the world ends up looking like. That's why you get countries like Rwanda and Philippines and South Africa, lower income countries, who still make it towards the top. Because even if they are lower income countries, they're doing a pretty good job of trying to distribute things equally between women and men. Another key message that comes out of the report is what's happening behind this in the four categories that we look at. And what we find is for 96% of the world, health gaps have been closed. For 93% of the world, education gaps have been closed, but only about 60% of economic gaps have been closed and only about 21% of political gaps. So the world has the talent. Women and men are equally talented. Right in this very room, women and men are equally talented, but women are not getting the same returns as men for that investment. Why does it matter? Well, one, it is fundamentally unfair. But I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to say it's in your self-interest. We find that healthier and more educated women lead to healthier and more educated families. There's a multiplier effect. 
we find that countries that have more women in the workforce do better, they're more prosperous. Countries that have more women in political leadership positions, they're more equal. They have better income distribution. Countries that have more women in leadership, both economic and political, are more peaceful and stable. And the same thing happens in companies. Companies that have more diverse teams at the top outperform those companies that don't. In fact, by some estimates, companies that have more women at the top outperform others by about 13% in stock markets. Who wouldn't want a return like that? And the answer is, unfortunately, even though we know, we're starting to know there is this business case, we're not necessarily acting on it. And why? Because we're not the rational human beings that we think we are, and because our structures are still designed for a very different world. They're designed for a world where caregiving looked very different, where the homemaker was primarily female, where the division of labor was something completely different. But in today's world, that's no longer the case, and that's no longer the aspiration either of women or of men. And so we need to think about changing these structures. There is some good news. We're moving in the right direction. So we've been doing this for 10 years, and what we found is that for most of the world, we're making progress. But that progress is incredibly slow, and it looks very different in different parts of the world. If we took a global average, it would take 81 years to close the economic gender gap. That means probably none of us in this room will be alive, probably. Um, it means that it could even be a while before our children see gender equality. What can be done to close gender gaps faster? How do we accelerate progress? We could try to change women. We could fix the women. Now, there's some evidence to suggest that because of social conditioning, because of how we've all grown up, Women are perhaps less confident. Women are not asking for raises. Women are not aspiring to leadership positions. And there's a whole converse side of this, which is about men and how they're conditioned and what they're aspiring to. There's a whole industry around this. There are books dedicated to this. There are conferences, there are networks, and they're all trying to fix the women. But the problem is the odds are stacked against women. They're not on a level playing field. And so there's something else we could do, which is change those structures. Change the playing field. Give everyone a fair fighting chance. That's part of what we're trying to do at the World Economic Forum. We work with leaders, we work with CEOs, we work with ministers, we work with heads of state, heads of NGOs. And that global leadership looks incredibly male. 95% of the CEOs in the Fortune 500 companies are men. Almost 90% of the heads of government around the world are men. About between 80 and 85% of all ministerial positions are occupied by men, and so on. But whether they're women or they're men, they have immense power. They have immense influence. They can disrupt their institutions. They can change the environment in which we're all working. They can change the environment in which we're all taking decisions about who should be at home and who should be in the workplace. They can change the environment in which we're determining who takes care of children. They can change the environment in which people are being promoted, retained, hired. And so that's who we are trying to influence. Again, the good news is most of these people have come a long way. In the last 10 years, there has been so much awareness raising. There's been so much of a case about why this is good for business, why this is good for the economy that most of them are convinced. But except for a few trailblazers, most don't necessarily know what to do. And so we try to do three things. One, we try to measure gender gaps. You saw a little bit of that. We do that for industries, we do that for countries. We benchmark, we tell them how far away they are from equality. Some would call it naming and shaming. I call it a little bit of healthy competition. A second thing we try to do is put forward the best practices. What is working? So there are countries that have got near the top. They must have done it somehow. What are those policies? What are those practices? There are companies that are examples. What are those interventions that they made? We make that information available to all. And then third, 
we try to see if we can put them together in some collaboration. Because a lot of companies are working on this themselves. They're having to reinvent the wheel. They're each having to, to try to figure out what it is that needs to be done to allow for a better environment, a better structure for women and men to be better employees. They could learn a lot more from each other. And governments are having to set policy in the dark. Many of them are not necessarily talking to one of their core constituencies, which is employers. And so we try to bring them together. I'm going to tell you about one experiment we tried. In Mexico, Turkey, Japan, and Korea, we tried to bring together the relevant ministry with the biggest employers in that country. And we gave them metrics. We told them where they stand. We gave them the business case. And we worked with them to try to set a target. And that target was, we're going to try to close the gender gap relative to our starting point by about 10%. In three years. We're two years into the experiment. And in Japan, we're at 7%. In Turkey, we're at 9%. But it is hard. It is hard to go over individual agendas. It is hard to get people to collaborate. It's hard to make people set aside their self-interest in the short term and make them work towards that longer term self-interest. We now have an opportunity to try to translate that into something more. To try to take those experiments and take them further. How can you help? Now, we tried to make this happen in a way that is tough, that's hard, that's messy, that's behind the scenes, that's working with leaders. I don't think that I have a silver bullet for you. In fact, if I have a message, it's that if the last 10 years of momentum have been about raising awareness, the next 10 years are about translating that, as hard as it is, into action. Being surgical about it, being strategic about it, putting people together. I don't think I have a hashtag for you, unless these count. But I don't think that in our 140 character world, these are going to go very far. And that's because this stuff is hard. It does take time. And it is going to take all of us to be working towards it. It's going to take all of us switching from the paradigm of awareness to the paradigm of action. It means all of us in this room are going to have to inform ourselves not just about how big the gender gap is in your country, not just about why it's important to close it, but actually being aware of how. And then lobbying your company, lobbying your policymakers, and working together. Thank you.